Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Jeff Carmel, member of Congregation Beth Am's Jewish and Israel Advocacy Committee, which is also known as Beth Am Jayak. And a very warm welcome to all this for this morning's continuing celebration of Israel on her 75th anniversary. We're indeed very fortunate to have one of Israel's most thoughtful and articulate speakers joining us from Israel. And those of you who, like me, have been privileged to hear my nod in the past will agree that we're in for a real treat. I would also like to recognize and thank the co-sponsors of our program, Beth Am a Jewish and Israel Advocacy Committee, Los Altos Hills, the Z3 Project of Oshman Family Jewish Community Center in Palo Alto. And um, I want to thank them for their time, effort, planning, and financial generosity. I'd also like to thank our other partners, Congregation Kolomet in Palo Alto, Congregation Beth David of Saratoga, Sonoma County Israel Committee, and Beth Am Women. Before we begin, I do have a few housekeeping announcements. First, there will be a question and answer session following Anat's remarks, and I encourage everybody to participate. Please try and be concise and formulate your questions as questions, not as comments. You can do so by clicking on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen and typing in your question. Secondly, within a few days, Everyone who is registered will receive access to a recording of this session in case you'd like to review anything or share with those who couldn't attend this morning. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our amazing Rabbi Heath Wattenmaker, who will welcome our guest speaker. Thanks so much, Jeff. Boker um, Tov, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us for this important talk. Um, as we continue to mark the 75th anniversary of the founding of the State of Israel, as Jeff said, I'm Rabbi Heath Wattenmaker, one of the rabbis here at Congregation Beth Am in Los Altos Hills. Um, and it's really my pleasure to be able to share just a few words of welcome with you this morning and to welcome our speaker and teacher this morning, Dr. Anat Wolf. I'll share a bit more about Dr. Wolf in a moment, but first I want to thank um, our co-sponsors and partners for this event. Um, as Jeff said, the Osman Family JCC and their Z3 project. Congregation Beth David, Congregation Kolomet, the Sonoma County Israel Committee, Beth Am Women, um, and of course, to shout out our fantastic um, and dedicated team of leaders um, with Beth Am's Jewish and Israel Advocacy Committee, um, who helped to make this <clears throat> event happen today. Um, I think at Beth Am, we recognize the complexity and diversity of views and opinions relating to Israel. Um, and it's so important that Israel, as Israel grapples with this complicated and complex moment in her history um, to inform ourselves and learn from leading thinkers like Dr. Will um, and to really engage with multiple points of view, even if we don't always see eye to eye. Uh, after all, one of our goals is that we continue to engage with and wrestle with Israel. Um, it is, after all, in our name, we are Am Yisrael, a people who wrestle with God uh, and who recognize that anything of true substance in, and importance uh, isn't simple and, and shouldn't be simple, but requires uh, engagement, commitment, grappling, and wrestling. Uh, so a bit about uh, Dr. Wolf. Uh, Dr. Anat Wolf is a leading thinker on Israel, Zionism, foreign policy, and education, as well as one of Israel's most articulate representatives on the international stage. A progressive former member of Knesset, uh, Israel's parliament. She served as chair of the education committee and member of the influential uh, foreign affairs and defense committees. Born and raised in Israel, Dr. Wolf served as a foreign policy advisor to Shimon Peres, uh, participated in peace talks with the Palestinian Authority. She also served as a senior fellow at the Jewish People Policy Institute, an adjunct fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, and a visiting professor at Georgetown University. He is currently a strategic consultant with McKinsey and Company, and a lecturer at Reichman University in Jerusalem, in Israel. Uh, Dr. Wolf has a BA from Harvard, an MBA from INSEED in France, and a PhD in political science from the University of Cambridge. Um, Dr. Wolf is the author of seven books that explore key issues in Israeli society. Uh, her most recent book, uh, We Should All Be Zionists, which was published in 2022, brings together her essays from the past four years on Israel, Zionism, and the path to peace. Um, 
as Jeff sort of alluded to at the beginning, uh, Einat has spoken here at Beth Am um, a few times over the years, and I know um, every time she's um, she's spoken, she's always left those who have learned from her with new insights and much to talk about. Um, we are so delighted to welcome Dr. Wolf back to Beth Am today, um, who joins us today to discuss an insider's analysis of Israel at seventy at, uh, of Israel at seventy five. So, Bruha Haba, welcome, Enat. Thank you, and uh, good evening from Israel. And thank you; it's a pleasure to be with you. And uh, for, thank you for this kind introduction. So, uh, given that this is on everyone's minds, I thought I'll start with an assessment of Israeli democracy. And I'll start by saying that not for a minute did I think that Israeli democracy is in threat. And I still don't think that Israeli democracy is in threat. And um, I acknowledge it's a relatively unique point of view and I don't belong in either camp, but I will explain why this is my view. I'll start with a short version of it that when the protests began and the calls for judicial reform, uh, you basically had one camp, the pro-judicial reform, making the case that because of Aharon Barak and the Supreme Court uh, taking so much power, Israel was basically not a democracy, but now that they're gonna put forward the judicial reform, Israel will finally be a democracy. Then those in the streets made the exact opposite point that Israel is and has been a democracy, but if judicial reform passes, then Israel will cease to be a democracy. And my view was that because those two camps are arguing, Israel is secure as a democracy. So I'll give a bit of background uh, on Israeli democracy and its underlying strength. Uh, Israel is actually one of the world's oldest democracies, which strikes people often as odd because we're still thinking of Israel, even at 75, as a very young country. Um, First of all, even as a country, Israel is already in the third of older countries. Two thirds of the world's uh, countries are younger than Israel or were established after Israel. But if you add to that, that most of Asia, Africa, Latin America, Eastern Europe, Southern Europe were not democracies until fairly recently, uh, you realize where actually the club of democracies is a fairly small club. And even within that fairly small club, Israel is one of the world's oldest democracies, maintained itself as a continuous democracy from the day it was born with no uh, military coups, with no suspension of elections. If you add to that mix what Israel had to deal with, wars and terrorism and massive waves of immigration, uh, you put all that into the mix, the achievement of Israeli democracy emerges uh, almost as a singular. Now, adds to that achievement the fact that the people who made Israel, uh, the Jews who immigrated, uh, as well as its Arab citizens, did not come from democratic traditions. Uh, They came from Minsk and Pinsk, from uh, Tzana and Rabat, those were not countries with democratic traditions. So you cannot say that the Jews brought with them democratic traditions. What they did bring with them is the Jewish democratic tradition, which is essentially the long civilization of Jewish argumentation, of Jewish debate, which I would argue is the deep strata that sustains Israeli democracy. Contrary to what I think has been one of the most destructive ideas in Israeli discourse in recent uh, decades, that there is a tension, perhaps even a contradiction between Israel being the sovereign state of the Jewish people, so Israel being Jewish, and it's being a democracy, the notion that this is an inherent uh, contradiction, uh, it's actually the opposite. Israel's democracy 
is sustained by the fact that it's Jewish, by the deep civilizational roots of the Jewish people, going back all the way to Abraham arguing with God. The Talmud, of course, is a codification of debate and disagreement going into Jewish communal structures over the centuries. And the Zionist Congress, which is the direct uh, ancestor of the Israeli Knesset, I was recently at a talk in Vienna and was inspired to reread one of my favorite books, uh, The World of Yesterday by Stefan Zweig. Stefan Zweig, the writer, talks of uh, meeting Herzl, who uh, was the editor of the most important section of pretty much the most important paper, certainly in Austria, but in much of Europe. And uh, he gives uh, Stefan Zweig his uh, big break. So in return, Zweig uh, decides to get close to Zionism. He wants to be nice to Herzl. At that time, Herzl holds both, uh, he's both uh, embarking on Zionism, but still uh, editing that section of the paper. And Zweig basically, after dabbling a little bit in Zionism, decides he wants none of it because he couldn't uh, deal with the constant, to use his words, quarreling, opposition, and disrespect to Herzl. Uh, so that goes back to the beginning of the Zionist Congress. That uh, quarrelsome debate uh, goes directly into the Israeli Knesset. And this is what deeply sustains Israeli democracy to the present. When people make comparisons to Turkey, Hungary, Poland, I think they are seriously shortchanging the strength of Israeli democracy. Uh, Turkey was never a democracy. Uh, Poland and Hungary were democracies for about five minutes. I think this really shortchanges how long Israeli democracy has uh, sustained itself and what are its deep uh, civilizational Jewish roots. So if I don't think that the issue here is about democracy, then what do I think is going on? And something clearly is going on. Uh, and I think it's much more uh, a fierce debate and battle over Zionism and especially what kind of uh, Zionism and what kind of state Israel is going to be. When Israel is established and the Zionist Congress becomes the Israeli Knesset, Israel extends its democracy to two groups who were obviously uh, had a very complex relationship with Zionism to say the least. The Arabs who become citizens of a state that they didn't want and many of whom actually fought against. They're clearly less than enthusiastic about Zionism. And also the ultra-Orthodox Jews which even have a theological opposition to Zionism but mostly view it as a means to restore the world of the yeshivot that was uh, pe that perished in the Shoah. Uh, now they become part of the Israeli Knesset, they vote, they get elected, but there is uh, a tacit understanding, broadly speaking, that as much as they're represented in the Israeli Knesset, and in the case of the ultra-Orthodox Jews, they were part of coalitions, but generally not of governments, they are along for the ride. Uh, in a recent article on this issue published in the state of Tel Aviv, I compared it to people who were given a toy wheel. So the actual wheel was in the hands of the Zionist parties, the centrist, mostly secular Zionist parties, and uh, the other parties could have the toy wheel and they would get budgets and there would be negotiations on things that are important for their community. But there was a tacit understanding that the state of Israel bears out the vision of its founding, mostly uh, secular Zionists. Now, I think what happened is that with this recent government, you could also argue that uh, similar issues were at play with the previous government and the entry of finally not an anti-Zionist Arab party into the coalition with Mansour Abbas saying clearly that Israel is a Jewish state and will remain a Jewish state. But because of the earlier historical tacit understandings, it was vulnerable to 
attacks, however cynically made, about the legitimacy of this government. What we have in this new government is half of the coalition that sustains this government is parties that I would argue in different ways, even when they call themselves Zionist, are actually outsiders to Zionism. They're either the ultra-Orthodox parties of different styles, uh, they are the kind of the Jewish fundamentalists and they are the settler parties, all of whom in different ways are challenging the centrist, historical, secular Zionist ethos with a very, very different vision for Israel. And what I think happened with, uh, especially with the declaration of judicial reform, is that res the response to it was not so much about the specific substance of uh, the arrangements between the courts and the Knesset and the government, but the judicial reform was taken as a kind of declaration of intent to rule. Basically that group, was demonstrating its uh, intention to wrest the actual wheel of the state. Um, and if you noticed when Netanyahu formed this government, he said, I'm in charge. I think he even said, my hands are on the wheel. Uh, basically playing into the historical tacit understanding that yes, uh, those are people who are outsiders to the centrist historical Zionist vision, but I, who's part of it, of the Likud party, the heir to the revisionist uh, vision, but is still part of centrist Zionism, my hands are on the wheel. But with the declaration of judicial reform, with uh, this coalition, with the coalition negotiations that felt almost like a feeding frenzy, uh, it felt that this coalition, and especially the those who have a very different vision for Israel, were resting the actual wheel, no longer content to be with the toy wheel. And they were using, taking advantage of Netanyahu's uh, kind of desperation and legal troubles in order to wrest control of the actual wheel. And what I think the protesters did instinctively was pull on the emergency brakes. Uh, and I think that's what the protests did more than any debate on democracy. And in that sense, I think even the protesters, it's not really about democracy in the sense that no one debates that this government was constituted after free and fair elections in the normal course of things, that it got the support of parliament, the way that uh, governments are constituted in parliamentary democracies. So it's not really about democracy. I say it's much more about legitimacy or Zionist legitimacy. It's about the protesters saying, even if you won in free and fair elections, even if you have uh, 64 seats in parliament, there is still no legitimacy to your vision for Israel and you cannot drive the car to where you want to drive it and we're pulling the emergency brakes. So I think it's much more about that, which is why on the one hand, I don't think Israeli democracy is in danger, but I have tremendous sympathy uh, and participated in some of the protests because I I'm certainly partial to the foundational Zionist vision of Israel. I don't think it's a coincidence that uh, the Declaration of Independence, the Israeli flag, the military, uh, the fighter pilots within the military became the symbols and the spearheads of uh, this, uh, uh, the protests because they are the symbols or the products of the traditional centrist Zionist ethos. And this is what I think the battle is about. Uh, I will have to say that I think in terms of the actual judicial reform, um, First of all, there are certain aspects of it that if they get passed, Israel by, by no means uh, ceases to be a democracy. But I think that in general, having had quite a few years of observing Netanyahu, some of them up close, I think he's lost all interest in the issue. Um, perhaps he was led to believe that it could help him with his legal 
uh, trouble. He certainly now believes that it will uh, do exactly the opposite. And if you can see, he's taken quite a few steps to backtrack the issue. Uh, most prominent among them is really the classical way that things got settled in Israel, um, essentially by uh, endless committee discussions. Uh, I'm sure you are aware that President Herzog has convened under the presidency uh, the representatives from the different parties to discuss a possible compromise on judicial reform. And if you've heard Netanyahu in recent interviews, he keeps on saying, um, as long as negotiations continue under the president, I'm supportive of that. I will support any kind of uh, um, agreement or compromise that comes out of the president's house. But if you were to have closed captions or subtitles underneath what Netanyahu said, it would say, and please President Herzog, keep the negotiations going for the next three years. Uh, and I think that he's trying to backtrack on this issue. Uh, he's historically a person of a, cons a conservative temperament in the real sense of the word. He doesn't uh, generally like to do radical uh, changes. This was in many ways out of character for him because uh, of the legal issue. And I think it's pretty clear that he's taking steps to backtrack. And it's not just a lull where he plans uh, to pounce. Others want it to be, but I think he personally has definitely lost all interest. But the issues will continue to dominate uh, in many ways what this government has done, and some people think it's a huge favor that it did to Zionism, is present the threat in such a clear and present way that it galvanized and mobilized Israel's traditional centrist Zionists to action. Uh, this also has to do, we are seeing it in the polls. There's no doubt that this also plays into Netanyahu wanting to backtrack. This current coalition is bleeding support uh, in the polls uh, to the centrist, uh, to Gantz's party, which literally, again, has another Zionist name, Hamachane Hamamlachti. There's almost no more Zionist word than Mamlachti, coined by Ben Gurion to. Uh, reflect that kind of centrist, state-based Zionist ethos. And he's the one that's capturing a lot of the um, fear and disappointment with this government, where many of the centrist voters are, of the Likud are saying, we did not sign up for this insanity. So we're going to indicate our support for traditional Zionist centrism. So uh, this is what uh, I think is going on. These, I, so I don't think we have threats for democracy, but we definitely have an alternative vision of Zionism. And, uh, and that would definitely need to be defeated uh, on multiple fronts. My uh, colleague, Shani Moore, with whom uh, we write a lot about uh, democracy uh, in the recent Sapir issue for Israel 75th, I wrote about Israel as a liberator and how Zionism has liberated us both to be the good, the bad, and the mediocre versions of ourselves, and that we can no longer blame anyone for the decisions we make, whether good decisions or bad decisions, and this is the essence of being sovereign. Uh, Shani Moore wrote about the threats uh, to Israel from the settler vision because while we both agree, and he writes it, that there's no inherent contradiction between being a Jewish state and being a democracy for all the citizens of the Jewish state, there is a contradiction between maintaining Israel's rule in the West Bank as permanent, which is the vision of some in the settler community, and being a democracy for the obvious reasons that despite all their best efforts, the settlers do not constitute more than a tiny minority um, around 10 to 15% of the population of the West Bank. And here I am very much uh, in favor of defeating the settler vision. Uh, and here I think in order to do so, one needs to understand what sustains it. And the biggest mistake is that thinking that what sustains it is the broad Israeli public. 
Uh, the broad Israeli public is generally at this point indifferent to it. Again, as long as it stays in the West Bank and does not seek to impose itself uh, on Israel proper. But what sustains it and what makes most Israelis indifferent to it is Palestinian rejectionism. Um, a few people know, for example, that really the beginning of the spread, the major spread of the Palestinian, of the settler project was when the Palestinians and the Soviets and the non-aligned movement pushed the Zionism as racism declaration. And the spread of Israeli settlements always went hand in hand with Palestinian and Arab rejectionism. Because fundamentally, uh, the vast majority of Israelis will always favor having a state, even in less territory, as long as it's the Jewish state, and they will always agree to pay price in territory um, if there is an actual promising uh, uh, way to peace, and sometimes even much less than that. For those who think that kind of there's no way to defeat the settler vision, that they're ascendant, that uh, they're going to make it impossible for Israel to ever, let's say, get out of uh, the most of the West Bank, I can share with you uh, a thought experiment that I do with right wing, even settler groups. I started doing it many years ago and at the time it was considered insane. Now, thanks to a Abraham Accords, a, a little less. But this was the thought experiment. I would tell these right-wing uh, settler audiences, imagine that the King of Morocco, King of Georgian, and King of Saudi do like Sadat. They come to the Israeli Knesset and they give the following speech. We are here to tell you on behalf of the proud Arab nation and the world of Islam that it's over. Yes, your idea that you are going to reclaim your sovereignty in the land of Israel after 2000 years sounded a bit weird, but we fought you and you fought back and you proved to us that you are truly attached to this land. You are the real Jews, you're not foreigners. And we have come to tell you, welcome back, welcome home. We will no longer fight you, not by wars and not by terrorism, not by international boy boycotts and not in international bodies. It's all over. But seriously, you know, those settlements up in the West Bank, they gotta go. At this moment, the West Bank is emptied out of its Jewish inhabitants. Now, I do this thought experiment and settlers and right-wing groups tell me, yeah, we know that, of course. We know that if Israelis are faced with a clear choice, peace, normalization with the Arab world, and the price of that is the West Bank, settlements in, in the West Bank, we know where the priorities lie. In the past, they used to add before the Abraham Accords, and it's never gonna happen, so we're safe. They also recognize that Arab and Palestinian rejectionism is what makes them so-called safe, what accounts for their ability to continue to exist. But they also equally recognize if Palestinian rejectionism ends due to Arab desire to end that, and they're the only ones in a position to end Palestinian rejectionism, that the vast majority of Israelis will clearly favor a Jewish state in part of the territory over continuing to fight for a settler uh, vision where Jews form a minority among a hostile Arab uh, world. Uh, so in that respect, to those who actually want to defeat this vision that I think undermines classic Zionism, you should have every interest to defeat Palestinian rejectionism. Pressuring Israel will make no difference because Israel in that is Israel is inherently pressured by its location. By location, I mean that as long as Jews care about the land of Canaan, as long as we want to reconstitute our sovereignty in the land of Israel, 
we are destined, some would say damned, to remain a tiny, tiny ethnic, linguistic, national, religious minority in a predominant Arab and Muslim world. And, and this is the one thing we can never get out of. Uh, sometimes in my talks, I say that when Israel was established in 1948, the ratio of Jews to Arabs in the region was one to 50. So what do, uh, does Ben-Gurion do? He calls upon Jews from all over the world to immigrate. It's a huge success. More than 3 million Jews immigrate in the next few decades. Uh, we make a lot of babies. Israel remains the most fertile, wealthy country in the world. We are more than 10 times the numbers of Jews that we were in 1948. The ratio of Jews to Arabs in the region is one to 60. So they've been busy too. And if you talk about the Muslim world at large, it's more than 100. So we are never, not with procreation, not with immigration, we're never going to get out of the Jewish minority status at, in an Arab and Muslim region. The Arab and Islamic conquests of the region in the seventh century were hugely successful. Uh, so we're not getting out of that minority status, which means inherently, structurally, regardless of which government uh, is in Israel, including this government, a true peace and normalization proposal with the Arab world will always be met with an agree, if that's the price, with an agreement to pay and territory. Uh, we even saw a preview of that that I don't think people highlight or give sufficient credit when again, in a Netanyahu government, was talking about annexation and some people really thought it was going to happen, even though it was clear that most Israelis don't care. And then the Emiratis basically told us, how about dropping annexation in exchange for direct flights to Dubai? And Israelis were like, heck yeah, uh, this is what we want. So even as a small preview, uh, and we saw it with uh, the Sinai and Egypt and much less than that in Oslo and Gaza and the disengagement, Israelis will trade territory for peace and often for much less than that. Because at the end of the day, we're cognizant of our minority status in the region. So, I want to end with, uh, there's a piece that's gonna be published soon in the forward. I was asked to write for, from Israel 75th to Israel's 100. Uh, I decided to write what could go right. And uh, in order to understand what could go right, we need to understand that one of the things about Israeli history is that whoever sustained Israeli security and especially whoever sold the Israeli military arms uh, also had outsized cultural influence in Israeli society. So in the late 40s, early 50s, it's the Soviet Union. Um, with all due thanks to Truman's recognition of Israel, um, Americans embargoed Israel. Uh, what sustains Israel, what makes it possible for the Yishuv and ultimately for the IDF to win the war of independence is that the Soviet Union allowed Czechoslovakia to send arms to the struggling uh, early army. And that's how we win. And this is an Israel that has kibbutzim and an Israel that has socialist uh, welfare system and healthcare and education. And if you listen to the radio, it's all Russian ballads put to Israeli words. And then in the late 50s and 60s, it's the French who sustain uh, Israeli uh, security. Uh, they uh, sell us uh, the reactor. Uh, they, they build the reactor. They are the ones who sell us the fighter planes, the mirages with which we win the Six Day War. And if you are in Israel in the 60s, the French literature departments and universities are packed and Yossi Banai tra translates French and so on, and that's what you hear on the radio. And of course, after the Yom Kippur War, America becomes the major supporter of uh, Israeli security, and this is a country that privatizes its economy and celebrates McDonald's openings, and America has the outsized cultural influence. So my question was, what if uh, going forward, it would be the Arab world that ends up sustaining Israeli security. 
We can see a security architecture with Gulf states and other Arab states, uh, security cooperation, intelligence cooperation, economic cooperation that will sustain Israeli security. What if that happens? If that happens, we can assume the pattern will continue uh, with profound implications for Israel domestically. Uh, imagine uh, this would be part of Saudi normalizations and uh, the Arab world will shift in the direction of supporting uh, Israel and its security. The Arab world is certainly in the position to tell the Palestinians to finally say yes to a Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza. In parentheses, to the credit of the Arabs, they've always known what the conflict is about, that it's not about the settlement or occupation. They knew that the conflict was always about a blanket denial and rejection of Zionism, of the right to, of the Jewish people to self-determination in any part of the land, in any territory. And the Palestinians were supported by the Arab world as the kind of the front guard of this battle against Zionism, the battle against the Jewish state. Um, so it is the Arab world that is precisely in the position to tell the Palestinians, we are now pursuing success and prosperity for our people. We no longer have need for anti-Zionism as a defining feature to uh, divert attention from our dysfunction because we're not as dysfunctional as we used to be. Uh, so we have no use for anti-Zionism and we're not going to underwrite Palestinian rejectionism anymore. So as part of normalization, we're gonna get Israel to say yes to a Palestinian state, but this time you're also gonna say yes. Um, and you can see an impact within Israeli society. Imagine Israel's Arab citizens no longer torn between their affinity for the Arab world, which is at war with the state of which they're citizens. Again, we saw a preview of that with Mansour Abbas. Mansour Abbas and his Islamist Ram party broke with the Arab joint list over the fact that the Arab joint list voted against the Abraham Accords in the Knesset. They understood that there are at least enough Arab citizens to make a small party who are not happy that the Arab parties voted against the Abraham Accords. So you could see a preview of the direct relations between Arab normalizations and Arab uh, citizens feeling more comfortable with the idea that Israel is a Jewish state and not seeking to challenge that. Um, for Israel's Mizrahi Jews, a key uh, element component of Israeli society, I mean, Israeli radio is already dominated by music, pop music that has uh, historical Arabic roots. But imagine that Arabic comes to mark the acculturation of elites, the way that French was, or the relationship with the Soviet Union, or going to American universities. Imagine that knowing Arabic, studying about the Muslim world, becomes the mark of elites. What sense of pride it will give like we see already today, Jews of Moroccan descent uh, working with Morocco to revive uh, Jewish symbols, uh, Jewish historical sites. Imagine the sense of pride that they will have in their Jewish identity coming from Arab and Muslim lands, not just a matter of nostalgia, but as a matter of present and future. And even with the Haredis, uh, one could imagine, I'm now studying the Norwegian model of draft, I think it would be terrible for Israel to have a professional army. I don't think we can do that. But we can imagine the Norwegian model where everyone has to uh, report for duty. So Haredi men, women, Arabs, Jews, imagine everyone reporting for duty. But in Norway, they only draft 15%. And because that's a small number, most end up being volunteers. But this way, you will keep the idea that everyone uh, reports for duty. The military can still take the people it needs most, those with the skills. Uh, but most people will not have to serve, and likely most of those who serve will be um, volunteers. So this was kind of my vision of how it could all go right. And I wanted to put it out there. The one thing I ended my piece with, and I'll end with this, I said, that even if all these things happen in Israel's 100th birthday, we can be sure of one thing, 
the Jews are going to bitterly complain, complain that things were so much better during Israel's 75th, and how did everything go so long? Thank you. Well, thank you, Anad. Had trouble getting back on here. Um, sure. What a wonderful presentation, and it has definitely uh, provoked a number of questions for you. I am going to just go over to look at the list. Well, this is a, a topic that you touched on, but I think this is an opening to go a little deeper. Um, yesterday at Beth Am, Nadav Tamir spoke at our synagogue, he's the director of J Street in Israel, and he stressed the need for a two-state solution. The stumbling, stumbling block, he implied, is the occupation by Israeli settlements in, excuse me, in the West Bank, Judea, Samaria. In your wonderful 2020 book, The War of Return, you perceive a very different reality as the obstacle to a peaceful outcome. Could you please share your perspective? Certainly. So as I said, I'm no supporter of the settler vision. Uh, I'm no supporter of the settlements. I think it has been Israel's biggest waste of resources. Uh, we could have been in a very different position if all the resources that went to that would have gone uh, to Israel uh, within its uh, internationally recognized territory. But I can explain empirically why settlements are not the reason we don't have peace. Uh, there are four empirical reasons. It's just a matter of fact. The first, of course, is that before 1967 and certainly before the late 1970s, when it really takes off, uh, there's no settlements. And yet the Arab world and the Palestinians remain in complete rejection of a Jewish state. Uh, if you look at the PLO logo from 1964, when it was established until 1967, uh, the, the Palestine that this organization seeks to liberate is Israel without Gaza and the West Bank that at this point are under Jordanian annexation and Egyptian occupation. The Palestine they seek to liberate is Israel within its pre-1949, uh, within its pre-1967 uh, ceasefire line. So there were no settlements for years and decades, and yet that did not create any opening uh, for peace. Uh, the second empirical uh, reason is that Ehud Barak, Ehud Olmert, two prime ministers, have made proposals for a Palestinian state, Barak in 2000, Olmert in 2008, we even have later ones, uh, but those were two, the two critical ones. The Palestinians could have emerged from those negotiations with the Palestinian state that ends Israel's military presence, so a free state, no occupation, no settlements. Settlements in both proposals were either gonna be dismantled or exchange for equivalent land. Um, and the Palestinians still walked away. Arafat walks away in 2000, Abu Mazen walks away in 2008, and they walk away to no criticism from their people, not even a, a minor op-ed that tells them, are you not? We could just, we could have had our state go back to the negotiating room and get it for us. And the reason is, that in walking away, they understand that what their people prize more than ending the occupation, more than ending the settlements, uh, they prize the Jews not having a state, uh, which was encapsulated in this um, unparalleled demand to return or to settle millions of Palestinians within the state of Israel by virtue of the numbers turning Israel into an Arab Palestinian state. So uh, they knew that their people continue to be committed as they have been for the last century to uh, the idea that a Jewish state in any borders is illegitimate. And therefore they had to walk away from an agreement 
that would give the Palestinian states in the West Bank and Gaza and uh, the occupation no settlements, but would legitimize the continued presence of a Jewish state uh, in the other part of the land. And at least to date, this has been completely contrary to who they are and what they believe in. So again, they could have had a state without settlements, settlements being dismantled or exchanged for equivalent land, and they walk away and they're not criticized for walking away. So that's empirical uh, proof number two, that settlements themselves are not the obstacle. Number three, um, Shaul Ariali, Ariali writes about it beautifully in Haaretz extensively. Ultimately, the settlement project is a failure. Despite Israel uh, more than 50 years controlling the West Bank, and before that, several decades, Gaza, 80% uh, of the settlers live on 2 3% of the land, mostly adjacent to the ceasefire line, to the green line. Um, it's not a project that changed uh, the situation in the West Bank, which is precisely why they cannot extend Israeli democracy to the West Bank, because they failed. They're a minority there. And by and large, they did not win the minds and hearts of Israelis. As I said, Israelis are indifferent because of Palestinian rejectionism. But given the choice, this is not something Israelis care about. And we saw it, of course, uh, in the disengagement. And this is empirical proof number four. Israel, I granted, it, it's stupid to build and then dismantle. I think we shouldn't have built in the first place. But Israel has demonstrated repeatedly its ruthless and effective ability to dismantle settlements when it considers its strategic goal to no longer be aligned with that of the settlement. So we saw it in the Sinai because the strategic goal of peace with Egypt, and we saw it in Gaza and the Northern West Bank. Uh, the strategic goal at the time was viewed trying to disentangle Israel from the territories, even if the Palestinians will not say yes to an agreement. So we have these four elements. Uh, Palestinians said no to peace, even when there were no settlements. And in the pre-1967, uh, they walked away from agreements that would have a state with no settlements with Barack and Omer to no criticism. The settlement projects basically uh, remain a small part uh, of the West Bank. And, um, and the fact that uh, Israel has demonstrated its ability. And like I said, because the vast majority of Israelis will always favor a Jewish state and part of the land over some vision of a Jewish minority controlling Arabs in a bigger part of the land, they will always agree to a smaller uh, state in exchange for true peace. Clearly a lot of Israelis uh, say they were willing to do all of that for Oslo. They were willing to do all of that for disengagement. And the feeling is that all of these didn't work. So the next time Israelis will be willing to dismantle uh, settlements uh, will only be for something that they genuinely think is the end of the conflict with the Arab and Muslim world. Uh, so pressuring Israel will achieve nothing. Let's imagine that you pressure Israel into, as I said, historically it worked the opposite the day that uh, Shimon Peres and Rabin allowed the settlement uh, in Sebastia to go forward is because Zionism is racism uh, passed in the United Nations and Israelis are like, uh, you know, the hell with that. But um, let's assume pressuring Israel works and all settlements are gone and they're dismantled and there's not a single settlement in the West Bank. That will bring us not an inch closer to peace at all. Uh, because the Palestinians, if anything, they will view it as an indication that the entire Jewish state is about to be dismantled. But again, their vision had nothing to do with settlements ever. Uh, when I explain what the conflict is about, the person who has helped me most to do so is Ernst Bevin, the British foreign minister after World War II. As I'm sure you know, uh, he was no friend to the Jewish people, no friend to Zionism, but somehow he gets it. Uh, in February of 1947, he goes to the British Parliament. He needs to explain why Britain has betrayed 
the trust or reneging on the trust on the mandate that it received from the ancestor of the UN, the League of Nations, uh, they're basically throwing the mandate back to the United Nations. He needs to explain why. And he says His Majesty's government has come to the conclusion that the conflict in the land is irreconcilable. This is February 1947. There's no state of Israel. There's no war. There's no Palestinian refugees, no settlements, no occupation. None of the things that we are told are at the heart of the conflict exist. And yet already in February of 1947, he calls it irreconcilable. And he says, look, there's two groups in the lands, Jews and Arabs, so there were never a question about who the groups are. And he says they each have a top priority. He calls it the point of principle. He says, for the Jews, the top priority is to establish a state. So they want a state. And he said, for the Arabs, the top priority, listen to that, is for the Jews not to have a state in any part of the land. He doesn't say that the top priority for the Arabs in the land, later to be called Palestinians, is uh, to have uh, a state and we're just not sure how to divide the land equitably. He says as a matter of top priority, the Jews want a state and the Arabs want the Jews not to have a state. Sometimes I just call it a conflict between Zionism and anti-Zionism, that's it. It's by definition irreconcilable, which why it can only end when the Arabs and especially the Palestinians forgo anti-Zionism as their top priority and develop a constructive vision of an Arab Palestinian state next to Israel rather than the destructive vision that they had for the last century of an Arab state that would replace Israel. A complex topic and you seem to make it all <laughs> quite clear. Um, Shelley asks, what are your thoughts on the desire of some American Jews to see the way that Judaism exists in America um, and how it should exist in Israel? Will that happen? Okay, so uh, for that, I have uh, a few uh, stories and examples be before uh, I make my point. Uh, the first is, of course, to understand the structural difference. American Judaism and American religion in general followed the market competition model where um, if you don't like your rabbi and you don't like the synagogue, uh, there's another one uh, that you can go and you can very much pretty much find one suited to your particular beliefs and values and interpretation of Judaism. Israel is one Jewish state. Uh, so that's it. We can't, as much as some of us want to, and a lot of people are toying with those ideas, as much as many of us would like to establish another Jewish state, we have only one, which means that all the debates and arguments have to happen within the state of Israel, including the interpretations of what Judaism is. Um, I have this talk that I give uh, to mostly non-Jews about what is a Jewish state. And after I take them through 4,000 years of Jewish life, I tell them that the Jewish state is the one state in the world where we get to argue about what it means to be the Jewish state. And that is, of course, again, what sustains Israeli democracy. So in Israel, that's it. There's only one state. Uh, you don't get to go and have another one if you don't like uh, how it's being run or how it interprets Judaism. Uh, you have to conduct all your debates within that singular state. Now, within that state, the American model of Judaism doesn't have the numbers. Now, why doesn't it have the numbers despite years, even decades of efforts by American reforms and conservatives especially to try to affect and implant their brand of Judaism in Israel? And here I rely on a great piece by my colleague from the Jewish People Policy Institute, uh, Shlomo Fischel, in which he said that American Jews are Protestants, Israeli Jews are Catholics. And he explained that essentially American Judaism developed along the lines of the American Protestant attitude to religion, where the idea was that religion is commensurate with liberal values. And you even had religious leaders in many of the liberal movements in America from abolition to civil rights. So Jews in America can conceive 
of Judaism as a matter of liberal ideals and values and progress, whereas Israeli Jews are Catholics means that the, is, the Zionism developed uh, like the, especially the French, but the European model of a national identity as anti-clerical. So Zionism is a rebellion against many aspects of Jewish life. It's certainly an anti-clerical movement uh, that does not see a role for rabbis, certainly not as rulers of the Jewish state, and that goes back to the toy wheel. Um, so the Zionist uh, Jewish identity is a very anti-clerical and almost anti-religious identity. Um, and, um, and that's, so a lot of the people that you would consider sharing uh, liberal and progressive values with American Jews are also likely to be the most militant anti-religious uh, people. I remember my whole exploration of this issue started quite a few years ago where I gave a talk at, I think it was the Park Avenue Synagogue. It was uh, against one of those eras of the women of the wall situation. And I was asked, how could I, as an avowed and open feminist, not mobilize for the cause of women at the wall, women of the wall? And I told them, look, as an Israeli feminist, I also come from that world of uh, secularism. And I look at the whole idea of praying at the wall, the idea that First of all, I don't, you know, I don't believe in the existence of a God, but to believe that he somehow resides at the wall more than other places and praying there makes more different than other places. I was like, I can't convey to you how alien this idea is to me. And they were shocked by my response. And I was shocked that they were shocked. Like, how did the, how is it not obvious? Um, so this began for me, this whole exploration. It also led to a couple of pieces uh, that I wrote about why generally the American Jews, when they care about certain values in Israel, by and large, they have to choose. Uh, because as I said, they don't have the numbers in Israel and they're never likely to have the numbers unless they all immigrate. But from the outside, they're not likely to have those numbers because of the way Zionism developed. And as a result, they'll have to choose. If they want people who care about Judaism as a religious identity, the people in Israel who care about Judaism as a religious identity are not likely to partake in their liberal values. And if they care about liberal values, uh, they're, not, they're likely mostly to have Jews who don't care about religion and who even are militant anti-clerical in their view. Sometimes I say, look, our reform of Judaism is Zionism, that's it. Um, so that's the choice. And I think especially with recent protests and with this government, it became even more stark. Uh, either support the more secular Zionist, but align generally with liberal values, mo with modernity, or if you care about religion, it's gonna look much more like half of this government. Shelley asks, what are your thoughts on the desire of some American Jews to see the way that Judaism exists in America be how it should exist in Israel? Will that happen? Uh, I think that's the question I just answered. Okay, well, we'll go on to another one. Um, can you describe, this is from Joanne, the relationship of the United Nations in Israel over 75 years, what has never changed, what has improved, and what has become worse. So sometimes I make the sad joke that in 1947, the United Nations uh, voted the General Assembly, people forget, was the, actually the General Assembly of the United Nations voted for partition, and as part of that, the creation of a Jewish state, and ever since, they've been trying to undo that. Um, so, and another half joke I have is that in the United Nations, the only time the nations are ever united is against Israel. Uh, so uh, basically what we have at the United Nations is the success 
of um, anti-Zionist, mostly Soviet propaganda, which has really overtaken uh, the United Nations together with the traditional method of Palestinian hijacking. And I will explain both. Um, in order to understand how anti-Zionism emerges in, as this respectable mask among the elites in order to mount an assault on Jewish life in the places where Jews actually are, uh, academia, journalism, uh, social justice um, organizations, you need to go back to how Russia and the Soviet Union dealt with Jews. So Tsarist Russia, of course, literally writes the book of anti-Semitism, the protocols of the elders of Zion. Now today, everyone can publish a book, so we don't realize it. But in the early 20th century, to have a book, that was respectable. So to get all these conspiracy theories about Jews appear in a book, lent it respectability. So this was the beginning of the process of lending, Russians lending respectability to the idea, to conspiracy theories around Jews. If you look at Nazi Germany, it didn't invent much. It really took a lot of what was in the protocols of the elders of Zion. Notice the word Zion. Now, when Tsarist Russia is brought down and replaced by the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union is officially anti-anti-Semitic. You have speeches by Lenin against anti-Semitism, but it really takes off after World War II. After World War II, the Soviets beat the Nazis. You don't get more anti-anti-Semitic than beating the Nazis. So anti-Semitism uh, can no longer be respectable. Not only does it belong to Tsarist Russia, it belongs to the enemy that they just defeated. So the Soviets begin a process of developing anti-Zionism as this respectable alternative. And just as they did with the protocols of the elders of Zion of giving these ideas respectability through a book, this time they gave it, they give it respectability through academia. They create an entire academic discipline in parentheses, I recommend reading the works of Isabella Taporovsky, who writes beautifully on that. Uh, they create an entire academic world where they publish things and then they quote each other. And then when you begin to have quotations and footnotes, it all seems very serious. And people were educated in that. Abu Mazen got his PhD in anti-Zionism, Holocaust denial, this whole world. Um, the, the entire kind of comparison of Israel to apartheid, imperialism, colonialism, genocide, Nazism, it begins there. It's not because people are angry at Netanyahu. People who tell you that they reached a recent conclusion that Israel's an apartheid state because of the settlements or because of, a, of uh, this Israeli government, they don't know their history. They're being entirely ahistorical. They are merely echoing a campaign that began in the 50s and 60s in the Soviet Union and was very effectively exported to Marxist left-wing circles in Europe in the 70s and 80s. If you want to ask why in the 70s and 80s Europe begins to turn against Israel, people always look to the, you know, it's the Yom Kippur War, it's the 82 Lebanon War. No, it's the very successful export of this Soviet anti-Zionist campaign, just like the protocols. To this day, they are, uh, they are reprinted, they are translated. And from this left-wing academic circles that were considered the elite, they made their world to the Anglo academic world and from that to social justice circles. And this is how they made it to the United Nations. After a decolonization, when a lot of the countries are non-aligned, the new countries in the United Nations, many of them identify with the Soviets and ganging up on Israel and Zionism becomes the political tool to coalesce the Soviet world with the non-aligned movement. And this is when you have Zionism as racism. And this is when you have the entire structure of the United Nations basically handed over to anti-Zionism under the guise of Palestinian rights, but it's basically a structure of anti-Zionism. From that, it makes it to the entire human rights world. And as my academic colleague, Jeffrey Herf wrote, uh, this 
the, this is the most successful Soviet propaganda campaign long after the Soviet Union is gone. It still lives on in uh, progressive left-wing human rights, United Nations circles. And again, it's the same uh, cycle of respectability. If the United Nations passes 1300 resolutions against Israel, at one point people say, well, it's the United Nations. And I'm sure you know Abba Ibn, our illustrious ambassador at the United Nations, when he saw that process happening, he spoke about the fact that uh, Algeria can bring forth a resolution in the United Nations General Assembly where no one has a veto, that the earth is flat, that Israel has flattened it, and it would pass by a vast majority with a few extensions. So he already saw this process happening. He saw how ridiculous it was. But we are here now when so many people look at this like amount of UN resolutions and human rights reports, and they don't see it for what it is anymore. Because again, everyone's quoting everyone. So it creates this web of respectability that's almost impossible to see through at one point. Um, Andrew asks, do you think there is a connection between the recent uptick in terrorism in Israel, the West Bank, Gaza, Lebanon, Syria, and the signing of a peace accord between Iran and Saudi Arabia brokered by China? Should Biden and Blinken have anticipated this? Is the hope for closer ties between Israel and Saudi Arabia now off the table? So uh, the uptick in terrorism, I actually think, has to do much more with uh, generally Netanyahu being distracted. Uh, to his credit, one thing Netanyahu always did is, on the one hand, he used his baritone voice to talk very tough, but in practice, he, he always de-escalates tensions. And uh, we, we saw it recently in Gaza. He, does, he tries to avoid as much as possible. Uh, Due to the, first of all, I think it's a temperament, but also to the strategic understanding that if the fewer images of terrorism, Israeli uh, reprisals are on Western televisions, the better, you know, just keep the issue off the media. And also it's better for uh, normalizations with Arab countries. Again, if there's no images in Al Jazeera and all that, you can slowly build normalization with Arab countries. So I think now that Netanyahu is more focused, uh, we can see his him getting back to his de-escalation strategy. It's true that it's more difficult that he now has people in his government who have very much an interest in an escalation strategy, uh, believing that somehow uh, having Israel go up in flames will be good for the settlement project. I don't know why they think that, but they have quite a few uh, writers and people who speak this way that uh, we know there's an interest in escalation, but Netanyahu is clearly against it. But on the broader issue of normalization in China, China wants stability. So China certainly has no interest in promoting or fomenting uh, terrorism in this region. They want stability and this is what's behind their effort. Uh, they see that the United States, and this is a consistent strategy that has to do with the changing aspects of energy in the US. So between uh, Obama, Trump, and Biden, there's actually a, a, a continuity of the United States, if not completely exiting the Middle East, substantially reducing its footprint and interest in the region. And China certainly has an interest, uh, it cares a lot about oil, it cares about trade, uh, has an interest in this region being stable. And normalizing Saudi-Iranian relations is certainly something they have an interest in. Uh, they recently said they wanted to try to uh, uh, moderate it uh, and help Israelis and Palestinians reach peace. And I was like, go at it. You know, It's not as if the West did such a great job, by the way, because the West uh, was too much subject to both the anti-Zionist campaign and to the vision that somehow the reason the problem is Israel and Israel needs to be pressured in the settlement. So who knows, maybe the Chinese will be a little more uh, objective about it. But you could see that what they're pursuing is a strategy of 
of a stability. And in that sense, normalization with Saudi is certainly not off the table. However, um, Saudi understands that it's the holy grail. Uh, it understands a bit like what I said in my earlier vision of everything that could go right. It's the hinge on which uh, everything changes because if Saudi normalizes relations, Saudi is not just its own state, it speaks for the broader Arab world, literally, literally from Arabia emerged the conquests uh, of the entire region. And it speaks to the Muslim world um, as the guarantor protector of the two holiest sites. So clearly it's the hinge and if Saudi normalizes it's not that the entire Arab and Muslim world will normalize, but it will be the tipping point where normalization will become the vanguard and being anti-Zionist will become more the laggard. So Algeria will probably be uh, still anti-Zionist and the Palestinians will take their time, but it will change their dynamic, the dynamic. Now, because Saudi is very much aware that it is the holy grail for that, it has a list of asks. Uh, and the list from Israel is pretty short. Um, I think at the end of the, I mean, it already gets a lot of things from Israel and intelligence and security cooperation. This will become perhaps more above board. But what, you know, it probably needs from Israel uh, a recognition of a Palestinian state and 80% plus of the West Bank. And as I said, the Saudis and the Arabs are the only ones in a position to tell the Palestinians, and this time you're gonna say yes to that. But most of what Saudi demands are, are from America. Uh, they still haven't given up on America. Um, they are not willing to take an anti-China stand, but they, they want a lot of things for America and they want a close relationship with America. But for that, America will have to do something that Democrats and progressives are not happy about, which is uh, deal with Saudi on a transactional basis rather than wag its finger at it uh, on human rights issues. Um, so the question is, uh, normalization is absolutely still on the table. The question is, will the American administration play ball? Rick asks, well, states. <laughs> Netanyahu's trial is in its fourth year. Why is it taking so long? And what do you think will be the outcome of it? That aspect, by the way, is a disaster. Uh, I mean, they've recently agreed to pare down 300 witnesses to 60 witnesses, but every witness is being grilled for like days, if not weeks, and then you have breaks. And it's been a complete disaster. In that sense, it's a kind of background noise. Now, I will say this. Um, there's actually no alternative for continuing the trial. Um, those who want the prime minister to uh, quit over the trial, I think that's dangerous because that means that every time you wanna get rid of a prime minister, you just indict him and that's it. You expect him to quit. So that's not a good option. And I think in the balance, uh, you need to let uh, a prime minister continue. Uh, you have the presumption of innocence. That's still the basis of the legal system and they should be allowed to defend themselves. And on the other hand, I also don't think it's good to like say that no indictments can be brought against sitting prime ministers because in a parliamentary system, that means you create a terrible incentive to be in office forever. So there's no, uh, there's no real alternative for the trial to continue, even though uh, as Netanyahu is still prime minister. But the one thing that I think should have been done is at least a commitment to making it quick. So looking to the future, there has to be a way to say, okay, uh, we we're going to indict this prime minister. There's no way we cannot press charges, but the trial is gonna be over in three months. We're gonna go through this issue and we're gonna figure out if they're, um, if they're guilty or not. What we have is a catastrophe on so many levels. It has been the reason that the, uh, the, whole, the trial just dominates the political situation in many ways. It's part of the reasons we have this coalition government because um, the parties of Gantz, of Lapid said 
they refused to be uh, in a coalition with a prime minister with an indictment and this stretches on for years. So if I have one takeaway from the entire situation is not to change any legislation. Uh, we have no real good democratic alternative to on the one hand, allowing indictments to go through, but also not having them be the final world word as to whether a prime minister stays in office, but the legal process has to be super quick. And that is a tremendous failure of uh, this entire process. And uh, this has to be a major takeaway that in general, trials cannot be allowed to last this long. First of all, for anyone, you know, the phrase justice delayed is justice denied. So first of all, it cannot uh, go on for this long for anyone and certainly not for high profile cases that send the entire country into political turmoil. Two people have asked pretty much the same question. Alex and Harv ask how you define Zionism as used in this talk. So um, Zionism is easily defined, the political movement for self-determination, liberty and equality of the Jewish people and their ancient homeland. Um, political, uh, that it's a political movement, I emphasize because a lot of people define Zionism as just the ancient longing for Zion. And again, this is a hey, historical worldview. Some religious people like to say that if Zionism is only the ancient Jewish longing for Zion, then why in the 19th century? Why not in the 10th? Why not in the 5th? Why not in the 15th? Uh, Zionism emerges as a political movement against a very specific historical background of the rise of modernity, of enlightenment, of the idea of uh, self-determination for peoples, the replacement of empires by nation states. So it's a political movement. What does the political movement seek to achieve? Self-determination, which again means the Jews are in charge of their own fate. This is why Zionism had to be uh, a secular movement because it was a movement that rebelled against what at this point was perceived as Jewish passivity, uh, waiting for the Messiah. Um, Zionism is basically a movement that says we are our own messiahs. It's a movement of self-redemption rather than just praying for that. And that is why it's such a modern movement because it believes in the ability of people to change the course of history. Um, Self-determination goes with uh, the desire for liberty, for equality. The key insight of Zionism is that Jews will never be free as individuals uh, if they do not also have liberty and self-determination and equality as a collective. Uh, and that in order for Jews, even who don't live in Israel, to be truly free, to be able to walk with their heads held high, the Jews need a state. Um, so liberty, uh, dignity, equality, self-determination, those are the goals of Zionism as a political movement. They remain the goals. Um, and ultimately it's in the ancient homeland because again, contrary to what people think about Kenya, Uganda, Herzl and the Zionist Congress never considered it anything other than a temporary solution. There was never any question that the state of the Jews will be in Israel, will be in Zion. Uh, Herzl, I think, was actually right about Uganda in the sense that if you think historically, it's almost crazy. In the early 20th century, he has a sense of urgency that you got to get Jews out of Europe each way you can. And if it's going to be Kenya, Uganda, then please. But, um, but again, going back to the Zionist uh, democracy and the Zionist Congress and the quarrelsome and opposition and um, uh, endless argumentation, um, you know, that was a huge debate in the Zionist Congress. But again, Zionism is in Zion, but it's a modern political movement with very clear goals. And um, in that sense, uh, it continues to have the same goals that Jews can govern themselves by themselves in their own state, be masters of their fate. Um, you know, the idea that power corrupts, all civilizations have this insight. It's in that sense, an easy insight. Um, 
only the Jews probably could have the insight that powerlessness corrupts, that the contortions you need to do in your soul when you're powerless and someone else has um, power over you, whether you live or die, they can slaughter you at will in order to distract attention from some problems, that corrupts the soul no less. So Zionism was still about the fact that Jews should be masters of their fate and that individually Jews will never be free uh, and will never be treated as equals in other societies unless they have a state. And you know, I often meet with uh, young Jews and some of them, uh, at least Zionist skeptics, some of them anti-Zionist, and they tell me, why do we even need a state anymore? It's so passe, it's more trouble than it's worth. It's a 19th century concept. And I have two answers. The, four, the first, a little light, I say, look, I wanna live in a John Lennon world, no borders, no religion, all of humanity living as one. It's just that when the Jews are asked to go first, they get a little suspicious. So I always say, look, if we'll be fair, there's 200 states in the world, we'll be 100. If 99 states fling over their borders, no immigration laws, uh, no symbols, no kind of uh, celebration of particular cultures in history, then we'll be number 100. It's just the notion that we are the problem in this world. The, the existence of Israel as a state somehow is a problem. It doesn't make sense. And the other thing I say, look, we do not have a moment in human history where Jews were treated as equals, as full equals, when there is not a state of Israel. Now, is it a coincidence? Could be. Do we want to find out if it's a coincidence? Probably not. Uh, and this is literally Herzl's vision that the existence of a state won't mean that every Jew has to live here, but the very existence of a state means that every Jew will know as, as citizens of other states that someone has their back. Shmuel asks, what can Israel do to promote the emergence of a Palestinian leader who supports peace with Israel and help make a two-state solution real? Um, so I'll start by saying that there is no use discussing Palestinian leaders. Uh, we have this notion that somehow Palestinian leaders have hijacked their people. And you know, the Palestinian leaders are extreme and the people are moderate and just peace loving and the problems, the leaders. Unfortunately, uh, it's exactly the opposite. And we show it from the beginning of the Palestinian struggle. Uh, the people have always been more extreme than their leaders. And like I said, Arafat went to negotiate and he was hugely criticized for going to negotiate. He wasn't criticized for leaving the negotiations, but he was heavily criticized for going to negotiate. The same with Abu Mazen. So the Palestinian leaders were actually moving, you know, they were trying to like deal with all the pressures and at least go negotiate. But they knew that they couldn't sign a deal because their people will not let any deal stand that allows the Jewish state to stand. And they knew that there's no deal um, if, you know, there's no deal that, that Israel will agree to uh, where it's required to engage in its own national suicide. So the problem is actually the Palestinian ethos. The Palestinian ethos of the people remains anti-Zionist, remains uh, wedded to the view that Zionism is a singular sin that made them singular victims in world history and that justice, this is why it's always called Students for Justice in Palestine and never Students for a State in Palestine, that justice will only be achieved when the injustice that is Zionism, that is the Jewish state will be erased from land. Now, often when I say that people are like, you're painting such a broad brush, there must be exceptions. And my answer is always be my guest. You know, I study this carefully, I follow it. Bring me, I always set the bar very low. Bring me a tweet, an op-ed of a Palestinian who will clearly and openly say, it is time to part with this vision of return, 
the Jewish state is here to remain. We will not demand return. Uh, we want to live next to a Jewish state. We recognize the legitimate claims of the Jewish people and at least part of the land. We want to live next to it rather than instead of it. And we know the implications of what it means. There will, you know, millions of Palestinians will not settle within the state of Israel. I always tell them, bring me one. And I've invented this word in the book. I call it West Planning because where the bar is not low, as I tell them, it has to be a Palestinian voice, either taped or in print, but you cannot tell me that they told you that because I don't trust Westerners anymore to interpret Palestinians. I realize that Westerners so eager to believe certain things have engaged in an act of what I called West planning, which is basically to say that when Palestinians say, we don't want two states, we want from the river to the sea, you'll always find the Westerner who will say, they don't really mean that, or you know, they know it's not gonna happen. Look, we saw it with Mansour Abbas, when an Arab leader in Israel wanted to make it clear that he's abandoning anti-Zionism as a principal um, characteristics of being an Arab citizen in Israel, he said very clearly multiple times in Hebrew, English, and Arabic, that Israel is a Jewish state and will remain a Jewish state and they're not gonna challenge Israel as a Jewish state. They just wanna make sure they're integrated into it. So when they wanna speak clearly, they know how to speak clearly and they don't need anyone to explain them. And no one who I sent to do homework has yet come back to me because this remains the defining Palestinian ethos. In many ways, you could say that the Palestinian national identity developed through history as an anti-Zionist identity. Arabs and Muslims don't have to be anti-Zionists. Um, after the Abraham Accords, uh, I, I had several talks with uh, Arabs and Muslims over anti-Zionism. In a mirror image of what you hear sometimes from Jews, they said, we know we've been lied to about Zionism. We want to understand what it means. And two of the people that I spoke to ended up co-writing an op-ed with me that started by saying we're proud Arabs, we're proud Muslims, and we're Zionists. And they went on to say that they see no contradiction between a proud Arab identity, a proud Muslim identity, and being a Zionist. So you can be Arab, you can be Muslim, and not deny the Jewish uh, right to self-determination in the land of Israel. To be a Palestinian is a bit more difficult because the, the Palestinian Arab identity developed very much in the course of the battle against Zionism. And therefore, in many ways, what needs to happen is that Palestinians need to redefine their very identity, their very ethos away from anti-Zionism into a constructive national project of building a state next to Israel rather than instead of it. This means that un until that happens, they're never gonna have leaders who are gonna say something different. But when Palestinians begin to change their ethos, then we will have Palestinian leaders who reflect that. Well, unfortunately, our time is just about up. And uh, I hope everyone enjoyed uh, your remarks, uh, not as much as I did. And we just can't thank you enough for being with us on, uh, I guess it's your Sunday evening, our Sunday morning. Um, and really for providing us with such provocative new insights uh, into complex uh, and the, the remarkable uh, complex issues and the remarkable state that Israel is at 75. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that Einat's latest book, We Should All Be Zionists, Essays on the Jewish State and the Path to Peace is available online. And if you like this morning's session and are so inclined, you can make donations to support this and future programs uh, at the link that I think is shown. Maybe it isn't at the moment, but hopefully will be. But um, as I mentioned earlier, registrants will shortly receive an email with a link to a recording of today's session. And you are welcome and even encouraged to share it with family and friends. And there will also be a link on how to order Anat's book and how to make donations uh, to help future programs similar to this. Thank you all for coming today and enjoy the rest of your Sunday.
Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>